All right. Um, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, warm welcome from Rome. We are so pleased that you can join us today from around the world for this webinar on C Plan, a new forest research and planning tool available through the FAO's cloud computing platform, CPAL. Uh, this year, 2021, marks the kickoff of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and we just saw the official launch of the UN Decade two weeks ago. I believe uh, many of you joining us today have been involved in and contributed to the UN Decade launch in some way through local to global level actions. The global restoration commitments and pledges have now reached almost 1 billion hectares. And thanks to this decade, uh, there has been even ever growing momentum to promote actions on the ground. However, our stakes are high and resources are limited. Today, we are so pleased to be showing and fully launching the C Plus tool, which aims to aid decision makers in identifying promising uh, cost effective restoration locations while identifying potential trade offs among impacts. I mentioned the full launch. Uh, actually, we have soft launched the tool in a session during the Global Landscape Forum Africa event on the 3rd of June in the lead up to the official decade launch. So today is a, a follow up webinar and we are very thrilled to be able to present and share with you uh, the more details of the tool functionalities. Uh, my name is Yoshi Gaga from FAO Forestry Division, and I have the honor of moderating today's webinar. And of course, I'm joined by great speakers and colleagues who are supporting us through this Zoom platform. So we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box and pose your questions in the Q&A box during the presentations. I'd also, I'd also like to remind the participants that uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, We'll be able to share with you the recording and the presentation materials after the webinar. So uh, no worries, you don't need to ask about it. Now uh, to get us started, I have the pleasure to introduce Julian Fox, who is the FAO team leader of the National Forest Monitoring Team and also serves as the coordinator of the task force of monitoring in support of the decade. Uh, Julian will help us to set the scene and provide us with some opening remarks. Uh, over to you, Julian. Thanks so much, Yoshihiko. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is webinar season, so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And uh, so what did we just witness? We witnessed the official launch of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration two weeks ago. And what a launch it was. Um, the World Day Environment Day website was viewed 140 million times. Many people are saying it's the, it was the most successful World Environment Day in the history of the, of the UN Day. And to many, it represented a turning point for the restoration movement. Uh, the moment it became a movement. So this is the perfect moment to, to launch a, a tool in support to the decade. We're really pleased to continue to build the momentum to be sharing and fully launching the C Plan tool in support to the decade today that's focused on integrating socioeconomic and biophysical data in forest restoration planning. It's really a joint effort between FAO, uh, SIGGIS, Silver Carbon, NASA Sevilla, and researchers at Peking University and Duke University, and the 10 countries that have been piloting the tool, including Vietnam, who has joined us today. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're working closely on piloting the tool, and really thanks again to collaborators, countries, and especially I'd like to acknowledge financial support from the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries of the Government of Japan. So the UN Decade aims to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of our planet's ecosystems, which, as we know, are integral in supporting all life on Earth and leaving us with a healthier planet as, and a healthier people. To meet this vision and to support the ambitious targets set by countries and private organizations, we must know where to restore, how to restore, and be able to monitor and measure what is working and undertake adaptive management when things are not working as we had hoped. These are critical to scaling up successful solutions and ensuring efficiency in our investments in the land sector. We also know that sound science-based restoration monitoring can help us to continue to raise restoration ambitions, maintain and strengthen political support, and ultimately get to where we want to be in 10 years. So the monitoring task force in, was established in support to the UN Decade and Ecosystem Restoration and FAO had the pleasure of being asked to lead the task force. It brings together over 280 experts from over 100 organizations and really we thank you so much for your contributions and for sharing our collective vision. 
which is that a science-based restoration movement should be informed by the best available technology and data for planning and monitoring restoration actions on the ground. This can help turn commitments into actions and can help scale investments in restoration. The task force has developed the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring, we call it the firm, to improve data access, transparency, and to ensure actions to meet ambitious restoration commitments are guided by the best available science. We have launched the Minimum Viable Product Firm Geospatial Platform two weeks ago at GLF Africa. And the platform is now available and accessible to all restoration stakeholders. And I'm sure somebody will put a link in, in the chat. So the firm has many functionalities. It provides a link to several tools and platforms. It will continue to evolve and needs to evolve through the decade. And it also provides linkage to, this, to the C-Plan tool, which we are presenting and launching today, which will further be integrated so it can be fully interoperable with the firm in the coming months. So in conclusion, the C-Plan tool is currently being piloted in 10 countries and similar to the firm platform, C-Plan will keep evolving with input from you, the restoration stakeholders. Today, we launch the first version. We hope you will join the effort in further developing the tool. It is a collaborative effort. Thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate your willingness to engage. We invite you to engage, ask questions and look forward to the discussion. Back to you, Yoshihiko. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julian, for those opening words and um, for highlighting the pivotal role of planning and monitoring in further scaling the restoration and also the importance of socioeconomic information to help attract further investment, uh, including from the private sector. And further, uh, it's very exciting to know how the C plan will, C plan will be incorporated to the firm, uh, the umbrella platform for the monitoring and reporting of the UN decade. So now uh, to kick us off, uh, I wanted to hand over the floor to the first two speakers, uh, Jeffrey Vincent and Yuan Yuan Yi to present the overview of the C plan. Uh, Jeff is a professor of uh, forest economics and management at Duke University. And Yuan Yuan is a research scientist at the National School of Development at Peking University. Uh, both have worked very closely over the past few years to develop several uh, socioeconomic data layers for the tool, um, providing theoretical background. Um, Jeff and Yuan Yuan, uh, I turn the floor to you both. Thank you, Yoshihiko. It's a pleasure to provide an overview of C-Plan to you. Over the past year, I've had the pleasure of developing this tool with a highly skilled team from FAO, the Spatial Informatics Group, Silva Carbon, Peking University, and my own organization, Duke University in the United States. Although this presentation bears the names of just me, and Yuan Yuan Yi, many others did contribute to the work that we'll present. C-Plan is a spatially explicit forest restoration planning tool. Uh, this means that it provides information on particular locations that are available uh, for restoration and information on what the costs, benefits, and risks might be associated with restoring those particular sites. It is a planning tool, not a monitoring tool. Monitoring is, of course, extremely important, as Julian has emphasized, but the purpose of this tool is to um, assist uh, restoration stakeholders in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors with identifying the locations that are most suitable for restoration, which stakeholders then can then investigate more carefully using information that's more detailed than is found in this tool. Um, I want to emphasize this tool is intended to support planning decisions, uh, not to make those decisions. It's part of the open source uh, toolkit that FAO has created in Open Forest CEPL, and it's Google Earth Engine based. Uh, the tool does emphasize socioeconomic factors, benefits, costs, and risks. And the reason for this emphasis is, is simple. If history is any guide, then the bulk of forest restoration is going to occur on marginal agricultural lands. These are lands that are currently being used by someone to grow crops or graze livestock, and the users are more likely to invest in growing trees on that land if they expect restoration to provide benefits that will outweigh the costs. Now, to date, most research on forest restoration has emphasized biophysical aspects of restoration, such as where are the locations on the planet's surface where conditions are right for growing trees. Now, this is essential research, uh, the tool draws on it, but this biophysical research on its own is not sufficient for 
measuring the suitability of restoration. Consideration of economics is particularly important in the current moment. Restoration is costly, um, both in terms of the opportunity cost of not using land for other purposes, but also for the direct uh, investment that may need to be made uh, to plant trees or to take other actions to encourage regeneration of sites. Um, in a fact sheet that came out about a year ago, UNEP and FAO estimated the cost of restoring 350 million hectares of land at $1 trillion total. And this estimate is, is kind of uh, incongru incongruously uh, placed over a shot of a, a coral reef, also important for restoration, but not our focus here today. Now, a trillion dollars is a lot, and um, uh, the, the need for this invested in is coming at a time when government budgets are stressed. This is a, a chart from a recent uh, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs report, uh, which shows that um, on average, governments in uh, low and middle income countries had uh, uh, deficits um, even before the pandemic, but deficits have worsened over the last year as a result of the pandemic. And so this is a time when uh, funding from traditional government sources is scarce. Um, it's a time when not much ODA, official development assistance flows to forestry. Uh, the left bar here is the annual estimate of needed funding for forest restoration, about $100 billion a year. Uh, total ODA in the environmental sector is around 30 or $40,000 a year. The slice of that that's specifically for ag forestry and fisheries is, is even smaller. So not much ODA has been flowing to uh, forestry and forest restoration. And we're also um, emerging from a period when the planting of trees declined. And these are data from uh, the latest forest resources assessment by FAO, um, uh, which shows that in every major region of the global south, uh, tree planting during the decade 2010 to 2020 was less than 2000 to 2010. So we face some significant challenges in promoting forest restoration. And the implication is that we need to use available funds cost effectively, uh, get as much restoration as possible for the use of those funds, but also attract additional funds by making a stronger case that restoration is worth it. Let me now tell you a, a bit more about the tool and how it may uh, be able to help in these regards. Um, to begin, uh, what do we mean by forest restoration in C plan? Uh, we adopt a broad definition, uh, which is the establishment of tree dominated ecosystems that supply forest goods and services. Uh, the types of services that are um, expected to come from forest. Uh, those could be provisioning services such as fuel wood or, or timber harvest. Um, sequestration of carbon, provision of biodiversity, habitat, um, improvement of water quality, and, and so on. Um, the conception of forest restoration in the tool is not limited to forests of naturally regenerated native species. That's an important component of forest restoration, but we adopt a broader view of restoration, uh, which includes planted forests, uh, includes um, introduced species. Um, however, in, we've set up this tool um, uh, so that it does uh, not focus on perennial tree crops, uh, such as oil palm, orchards, rubber. So we're really focusing on tree dominated ecosystems that supply what would conventionally be thought of as forest related goods and services. Now here's some key features of the, the tool. And we'll talk uh, first about inputs into it and then about outputs. Um, the tool is designed so that users can provide key input. A um, uh, first uh, uh, type of input that's very important is to select the area of interest or AOI. What's the country, group of countries, or region within a country that users are interested in? So users get to select this. Um, next, users rate the importance of different potential restoration benefits to them. And currently the tool has four types of benefits, local livelihoods, wood production, biodiversity conservation, and carbon sequestration. So users will rate the relative importance of each of these benefits uh, to them. And we expect that different stakeholders would rate these uh, benefits differently. Um, these first two layers on local livelihoods and wood production do use uh, data that's uh, newly created by the uh, C-Plan team. 
Users um, can apply constraints, and I'll show you a list of those later. Uh, these refer to particular ecological and socioeconomic risks that affect the uh, feasibility of restoration. And advanced users can upload their own customized data, data layers um, if they have access to those layers. The tool comes with built-in data layers based on the best available data sets that we were able to, to find and, and process, but users in particular countries may have access to better data than we did. So users provide um, input, which enables them to tailor uh, the tool to their purposes. And then the tool provides the users with uh, spatial information, maps that show locations of uh, uh, restorable areas and their features. Um, uh, the tool also provides information in chart form and, and numerical form. And very importantly, it provides a restoration suitability index. Now, this is an index on a one to five scale with five indicating a higher level of suitability. And you can interpret this as a relative benefit cost ratio uh, for roughly one kilometer grid cells. So uh, cells with higher values as index are ones where restoration is more suitable. And the uh, benefits portion of this takes advantage of the input that the that users provide, okay, the ratings they provide on the relative importance of different benefits. So those get weighted according to users' ratings. And then the cost portion of this accounts for both the opportunity cost of the land and also the cost of um, uh, uh, getting trees to regenerate on that land. Um, the geographical scope of the tool is not completely global. global. Uh, the tool focuses on low and middle income countries. It has data for 139 such countries. They're shown in green here. These are countries where there is significant restoration potential, but also where often information on socioeconomics, uh, uh, socioeconomics of restoration is more limited. So we've, we've uh, focused the tool on uh, these countries currently. Um, Within those countries, the tool identifies potential restoration sites. And it does that by beginning with uh, information on where trees can grow. And that's from a paper published in Science two years ago uh, by uh, Jean-Francois Bastien and, and others. So start with the areas where trees can grow and then identify those locations where the actual tree cover is less than the potential. And so those will be the potential restoration sites where there's literally room to grow. And then the tool also uh, uh, removes urban areas. Uh, uh, so this is a tool that's focused on restoration in rural areas. Constraints, I mentioned uh, uh, the tool provides users with the opportunity to apply constraints which reflect ecological and uh, socioeconomic risks. I'll give you one example, uh, terrestrial ecoregion, the tool includes information on terrestrial ecoregions. Uh, one of those terrestrial ecoregions is natural grasslands. So these are areas where under natural conditions, the dominant vegetation would be a grassland. If users prefer not to restore tree cover in those areas, those areas can be masked out and not included in the restoration uh, plan that the uh, uh, tool provides information on. We've invested a lot of effort in developing improved information on the costs of restoration. At this point, I'm going to hand the virtual microphone over to my colleague, Yuan Yuan Yi, who will take you through the development of those cost layers. Yuan Yuan? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And hello, colleagues. It's my uh, great pleasure to present how the tool has constructed the cost layer. Uh, basically, the cost of reforestation would uh, consist of uh, two parts. Uh, the first part of the cost information is the opportunity cost of taking up the current piece of land that is currently not used for forestry. This would refer to the value of land in whatever it has been used. In most cases, this would mean the value of land used for crop production or used as pasture land for livestock production. A special note is that if a site has a mix of cropland and pasture land, the seed plant tool uses crop uh, land uh, opportunity cost. The spatial unit of the cost layers is 10 square kilometers. 
Uh, in addition to the opportunity costs, the second part of the cost of a reforestation is the establishment cost. This means the cost of planting trees, and we include this cost as maintenance for the first three to five years. And the spatial unit of the establishment cost is at the level one administrative subdivisions. In most countries, this level refers to state or provinces. Uh, for all the costs, they are measured in US dollars per hectare and in 2017 uh, price levels. Well, in the next three slides, I will briefly introduce the steps on how we get the estimates for each cost. So now uh, here are the steps on how we estimate the value of land in crop uh, production. Uh, so firstly, uh, yeah, firstly, our estimation uh, is based on the global crop revenue data set called MAPSTEM produced by uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute. We obtained the most recent one for year 2010 and graded for each 10 square kilometers of grid cell. Secondly, we use uh, the national data of value of agricultural production in the FAO stat uh, data set and updated the map spam's crop revenue uh, from 2010 to the uh, 2017 price levels. The third step uh, is key, that we determine the share of the revenue attributed to land. For the land share, we use economic and the statistical model to estimate the land share using the RULIS data set provided by the FAO's RULIS project team. The RULIS project has uh, syn synthesized the survey data from the World Bank's Living uh, Standards Measurement Study in a large number of low and middle income countries. The last step is to multiply the crop revenue uh, by the land share. And this gives us the annual return from land used for crop in uh, 2017. Then we convert annual return using uh, the 7% discount rate for a forward looking purpose. Assuming in the future an, an annual discount rate of 7%, we divide uh, the annual land value by this uh, discount rate to get an estimate of opportunity cost of taking up the cropland. This is the overall methodology of uh, estimating the opportunity cost of restoration on cropland. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, so for land used as pasture land that raises animals for livestock production, we use a similar strategy to get the estimate of opportunity cost of the land. The only difference is a map that shows which land areas are pasture land and the revenue of livestock production. On the pasture land part, we use, as, as the map shows, we use the 2000 FAO pasture map. Then we use uh, statistical methods to update this map into a 2015 map uh, of pasture land. <coughs> Excuse me. And then on livestock, we use the uh, 2010 greeted livestock of five main uh, animals, uh, including buffalo, cattle, goat, horse, and sheep from the uh, greeted livestock of the world on Harvard Dataverse. And using the national data of FAO's livestock systems on stocks and the production values, we update the 2010 uh, greeded livestock to 2015 aggregate revenue, also at 10 square kilometer grid cell level. Then it would be the similar steps to multiplying the aggregate revenue by the land share of livestock production uh, attributed to land, that we imputed the land shares from the uh, survey data. Finally, dividing the land value by the discount rate of 7%. So we get the opportunity cost of taking up the pasture land. Uh, well, the next slide 
is on uh, forest uh, establishment cost. So yeah, the strategy is different. On, on the estimation of the establishment cost, we use the strategy that can be named as a downscaling strategy. The method mainly takes four steps. Uh, in step one, we extract the cost estimates from World Bank project documents, including the afforestation and the reforestation projects that the World Bank sponsored in many countries. Then in step two, uh, we obtain spatial data on variables that could be affecting cost. These variables include data from a gridded global data sets for GDP and the demographic changes over the period from 1990 to 2015. And the next, we use statistical models to estimate the relationship that how these cost estimates could be affected by the spatial variables, economic variables and the demographic variables. Then the final step is based on the uh, statistical relationship estimated in step three, we use the parameters to predict the costs for each level one sub subdivisions, such as where the polygon areas represent. Uh, okay, in the last slide, uh, on the uh, cost information, Jeff and I would like to give you an illustration on how greatly the costs vary globally. For example, the opportunity cost for cropland has a median value of a bit higher than uh, 2000 US dollars per hectare, and the average is a little over 3000 US dollars. Here in these pictures, as you see values in the right end is 5,000 US dollars or 200 US dollars. Uh, it doesn't mean that the actual largest value is 5,000 or 200 respectively. Uh, we have cut off the data for display, uh, for display purpose only. Um, there are more values uh, after the uh, right tail. Then, Okay, for the opportunity cost for pasture land, the median value that's quite low is roughly like 20 US dollars. And the majority of the grid cells of pasture land have very low land return as the distribution suggests that most are lower than 100 US uh, dollars. Then uh, lastly, as you can see from the bottom, the, gra the, the graph shows, the average establishment cost uh, as shown by the normal distribution and the peak of this normal distribution uh, shows that is around 1,500 US dollars and uh, it varies greatly over uh, places. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'd stop for now and hand it over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yuan Yuan. Um, I just want to note that the emphasis here was on, in terms of establishment costs, was on costs associated with planting trees. The tool does include information on the variability of success in natural regeneration as well. As we, we recognize that not only tree planting, but natural regeneration is also um, a way to restore forests. Now, um, you know, every tool um, has, uh, it, you know, is better for some tasks than others, and C plans no exception. Here are some key limitations of C plan. Um, it does not provide information on specific tree species. Um, that's information that would have to be developed locally. It does not provide information on specific regeneration methods, aside from broadly providing information on uh, 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 different aspects of natural regeneration and artificial regeneration, at least some aspects of those. Um, but the detail on which methods should be applied in which locations, when you get, you know, start looking at particular types of natural regeneration or artificial regeneration, uh, would have to be left to users who would draw on um, more detailed local information. And the benefits in this tool do not account for interdependencies between sites. So 
the way the tool is set up, uh, individual sites have been assigned benefit values. Um, uh, but we recognize that uh, the value of a site can depend very much on what's happening in sites around it. Uh, the current formulation, the tool does not include those kinds of interdependencies. Um, and so what this all means is that this tool is going to be more useful for planning at larger scales, where uh, uh, the, the purpose is to identify locations where restoration appears to be more suitable, and then where more targeted in-depth planning exercises can be conducted. Um, I'll close by noting there are many restoration stakeholders in addition to landholders and local communities. Um, and uh, we've designed a tool to try to be useful to this broader range of stakeholders too. Um, those include national forestry agencies, international organizations, uh, nonprofit conservation organizations, and also the private sector and private sector organizations. And I will close by noting that um, engaging this last group may be particularly important given the financing challenge that we face with respect to forest restoration. I'll stop there. I thank you very much uh, for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments and suggestions on how we can improve this tool. So thank you. Many thanks uh, Jeff and Yuan Yuan for the presentation and for the overview of the tool uh, providing the key features which actually allow users to prioritize different restoration benefits while also applying constraints on ecological and social elements. But the caveat is that as uh, Jeff mentioned uh, there are some limitation. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, nice, very nice to see the process of developing the cost areas that Yuan Yuan presented, which will provide a transparency to, uh, to the tool's approach. I see, um, yeah, nice questions are coming in. Um, I really encourage our colleagues to uh, continue to post questions in the Q&A &A box approaches. Now, I would like to turn the floor over to another set of colleagues for the second presentation, uh, which is the demonstration of the tool and to introduce uh, Karis Tennyson and John Dilger, both from Special Informatics Group SIG. Karis is the director of the Environment Mapping Program and John is a research scientist specializing in remote sensing applications. So based on the approach and data layers just presented by Jeff and Yuan Yuan, uh, Karis and Jeff, uh, sorry, Je John have developed and finalized this C plan. And today they will uh, walk us through key functionalities available on the user interface. So, Karis and Jung, uh, I pass the floor over to you. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, so, now that you have a, a good sense of the input layers going into the tool and the objectives, um, we wanted to show you a quick demonstration of what the tool looks like. Um, it's composed of two parts. Um, so the first is where you do your user input. It includes a questionnaire, a selection of a study region, um, and some constraints using all the input layers that Jeff and Yuan Yuan just um, gave you information about. And then it presents you with some results. So I'll pause here and have John go ahead and play the video and then um, we can talk about um, the next steps of how you might want to test it and pilot it in your region. All right, let me share this. And we're sharing a video today because it is not always a great idea to do live demos. Um, Karis, can you just confirm my screen is showing? Yep. All right. Restoring forested landscapes offers profound benefits, including storing carbon, improving biodiversity, purifying water and air, buffering against floods and extreme weather, and providing people with food and other resources. Restoring degraded forests presents an opportunity to improve the lives and livelihoods of people around the world. A new planning tool from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations helps countries and restoration actors grasp that opportunity. The tool is adaptive, customizable, and open source. CPLAN, the restoration planning tool, will be integrated inside the CEPAL dashboard as an application. CPLAN incorporates layers on benefits, costs, and constraints. Once opened, you will see a landing page that provides information about the tool and the partners who helped develop it. The tool is separated into four computation steps, 
and two result steps. In the first step, you will be asked to select an area of interest for your study that will be used throughout the tool. Two selection options are available. The first is to select an administrative boundary, and the second is to use custom geometries. Administrative boundaries include country borders and first or second level administrative boundaries. Custom geometries allow you to draw a shape, use an earth engine asset, or upload a file to define the area of interest. The focus of CPLAN is on low and middle income countries, which have great restoration potential, but face more informational and financial constraints than high income countries do. Once the boundary is selected, you can move to the questionnaire. The questionnaire section is split into two steps, restoration constraints and benefits. Constraints are a set of criteria that limit areas available for restoration. They can be activated or deactivated by selecting them inside the drop-down menu. The constraints are broken into four categories. Land use constraints include specific land use covers. Biophysical constraints include rainfall, water stress, elevation, and slope. Socioeconomic constraints include protected areas, population density, and property rights protection. And forest change constraints include information on deforestation rates, climate risk, and natural regeneration. Selected constraints will display a short description describing how they restrict areas from the map. Restoration benefits are a set of goals for your restoration project. They can be adjusted by using the tool to rank your priorities by importance. The different type of benefits include local livelihoods, wood production, carbon sequestration, and biodiversity conservation. Each type of benefit includes one or more layers that will be used in the calculation. Selecting no importance will exclude those layers from the calculation. Once you've provided constraint and benefit information in the questionnaire, the module will evaluate how to weigh each input according to your preference. In the customized layers input table, you will find all the layers that will be used to compute the restoration dashboard. Users remain in complete control of the tool and can manually replace each layer if the default layer is insufficient. Replacing a layer is simple. Clicking on the action button will open a pop-up window displaying a description of the layer, an option to change the layer or the layer units, and a preview of the layer. Once the modifications are set, you can click the Save button or click Cancel to use the default layer. The tool checks that a user has access to the custom layer they want to set. If the custom layer is not accessible, the default layer will be used. The recipe section can be used to load the weights, constraints, and area of interest from a previously saved model. Each time you run the tool, a recipe will be saved to your Sepal account. Clicking the validation button will load the data from the uploaded recipe or use the inputted information from the previous steps. Information is then displayed about the computation, showing what parameters the tool will use to run the calculations. The results map is created by clicking on the Compute button. After a few moments, the map will zoom to the area of interest. The map indicates priority areas of restoration potential based on your specific ranking of restoration constraints and benefits. It represents the ratio of the weighted sum benefits divided by the costs. 
costs include both opportunity and establishment costs. Areas that are blue indicate a higher return on investment, while areas mapped in red indicate a lower return. The map could show, for instance, the precise areas where restoring forests would yield the largest potential increases in carbon storage, food provisioning, or flood control relative to the costs and risks. Comparing the relative magnitude of this indicator between sites can help identify which sites offer a high return on investment. To refine your analysis, you can compare areas that seem promising in the dashboard. Investigate the restoration suitability map and identify some areas that seem promising. Once identified, you can draw a boundary around these regions to run summary statistics for comparison in the dashboard. The dashboard presents a detailed analysis of the estimated benefits, costs, and constraints. This information can help you assess trade-offs and restoration priorities between regions of interest. The first section provides a summary of restoration suitability by region. This summarizes the area of promising cost-effective restoration locations from low to high. For instance, we can see that in the primary area of interest, there are relatively few very high restoration suitability areas. However, when looking at our first sub area of interest, we see that there is much more high and very high suitability. We can also compare each area of interest by their input benefits. The benefits section shows what the average value of each layer is by their region. This can give insight into each layer and aid in selection between potential sites. Each layer has a drop down text to display details about the layer. Similarly, the cost portion of the report sums up the cost inputs for each area of interest. Lastly, the constraints area of the report shows the percent coverage of each constraint. This lets decision makers know which areas are being excluded from consideration of restoration in both the primary area of interest and the sub areas of interest. Forest restoration requires that decision makers consider many biophysical, socioeconomic, and other factors when deciding where to pursue restoration interventions to ensure the highest chances of success. C-Plan combines data on where tree restoration is biophysically possible with regional socioeconomic data to identify areas where restoring forests is both technically feasible and financially viable. It helps zero in on priority areas where planting trees would pay the greatest social and environmental dividends. This tool provides a medium to quantify user priorities and help them better understand how restoration interventions will help achieve their goals. So that was a quick snapshot of how to work with the tool. Um, the one thing I'll suggest is um, the tool is available. So we encourage everybody um, to check it out and see what the results look like in your region of interest. Um, the nice thing about the tool is the calculations run really fast. So you can um, input a couple different scenarios and see what the results look like. Um, for those of you that have worked planning restorations, you know there are a lot of potential benefits that come out of um, these restoration projects. And there are a lot of communities and stakeholders that the benefits um, will impact. So we also suggest, you know, interacting with your stakeholders and coming up with a, a list of benefits of interest, constraints of interest, and then you can um, use that information to run alternative scenarios and then present those, um, you know, suggested 
high uh, return areas back to your stakeholders. So we hope that this is a nice interactive tool that you can use for community engagement as you continue through the decision-making process of where to plan or how to plan your um, restoration activities. I'll turn it back to you, Yoshihiko. All right, great. Yeah, thank you so much, Taris and Joan, uh, for the demonstration. And really nice to see this step-by-step -step description. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, the greatest advantage of this tool is I think the data layers are customizable depending on the data availability uh, for the area of interest. Uh, I wanted, uh, I also wanted to highlight the great contribution by our FAO colleague, Kirik uh, Rambot, uh, in developing and finalizing the tool's user interface. Uh, I really appreciate your work. So um, thanks again to all the speakers so far. Um, as mentioned by some colleagues already, uh, this tool is currently in the testing phase and being tested primarily by government colleagues in several countries. We will shift to the Q&A session shortly, but before we move on, I would like to turn the floor quickly to colleagues who's working at the country level. Uh, Maria Kono from Silver Carbon and uh, from Nyop Hai, uh, apologies for my pronunciation, uh, from uh, Vietnamese Forest Inventory and Planning Institute, VP. Uh, Maria has been coordinating, coordinating the consultation meetings with country colleagues to collect feedback and has recently organized a focus group with uh, Vietnamese colleagues. So she will be able to share such efforts and also future plans for rolling out uh, the tool. And Hai uh, is a remote sensing specialist at PP, uh, working on forest cover mapping and land cover change monitoring, who will be able to share some perspectives on the challenges and priorities in research and planning in the country, and some initial ideas on how this C plan tool could uh, help with it. So I pass the floor first to Maria and onward to Hai. Thank you, Yoshihiko. As we heard already several times uh, today, the, the tool is really customizable. And uh, when we were developing it, we had the future users in mind. And here we would like to acknowledge um, that we have been really fortunate that from the beginning of the, de the development of this tool, uh, we had um, uh, several of our country partners involved in the, um, in the tool development. Uh, and uh, here in particular, I would like to acknowledge this, the, um, the inputs that we have collected uh, through several uh, focus groups and uh, meetings uh, that we scheduled or held in the past year with uh, colleagues from forestry agencies in the Mekong region, so that includes uh, Cambodia, Lao PDR and Vietnam, as well as uh, colleagues from East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya and Uganda, and uh, our colleagues from the Servier Amazonia Hub. Uh, so uh, all this um, uh, input really helped us to uh, get to the tool in its current state uh, and uh, as it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, this is just the beginning and uh, the tool is really customizable and uh, will further be developed by the future users. So how to, uh, to further engage is in the next uh, few months um, or a year uh, we are uh, going to work with uh, different uh, country partners uh, at uh, specific uh, landscape levels to test the tool at different scale to test the tool with different data layers, national data layers, or even um, uh, more specific um, uh, landscape uh, information that they have in order to see how it will perform and how it can help uh, some of their practical decision-making uh, processes. So I'm not gonna talk um, uh, a lot about this because it's, it really depends on, the, on each country context and uh, it will be different uh, for uh, specific uh, purposes. But I would like to, uh, here I would like to introduce our colleague from uh, Vietnam, from the Forest Inventory and Planning Institute, Pam Nok Hai, uh, who has been working uh, for many years um, in many different uh, uh, areas of um, uh, implementing or uh, using remote sensing for uh, forest decision making. And um, Hai is going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the challenges and priorities for Vietnam when it comes to forest restoration and then also um, the possibility for using uh, this kind of uh, tool. Uh, particularly, we have one area in mind, which is the central highlands of Vietnam, uh, which has been uh, one of the priority areas for the Vietnamese government for forest restoration. So hi, the floor is all yours whenever you are ready. Yeah, thank you, Marisa and uh, Oshikito. Um, I would like to share my screen.
Yeah. Um, uh, in this context of this webinar, I would like to share some about information of uh, forest uh, restoration uh, in Vietnam, some challenges and some priority in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. As you know, so Vietnam has been the experience of deforestation before the 1990. And uh, from 90 up to now, uh, the forest cover in Vietnam are significant to increase uh, uh, almost about uh, 42% in uh, 2020. And uh, through uh, a lot of uh, series of national forest uh, restoration program as uh, six, six, one, farm, and uh, three, two, seven program. There's a lot of uh, uh, forest uh, restoration program uh, has been established in Vietnam and some uh, uh, recently and some international commitment as a red plus. And uh, Vietnam is perhaps also the national strategy for protect and improvement the quality of forest. And uh, app, uh, the forest restoration planning is a key feature to identify first to state a pass of forest cover and potential area of forest restoration planning and the environment and social impact for app, uh, forest restoration project and planning also. And uh, yes, we have uh, for forest restoration planning, we have some uh, challenging for information. For example, here, we, I would like to uh, ask my three in for three challenging, yeah, the first is the uh, land cover and forest cover in Vietnam are very dynamic and fragment due to economic development and local practice. The second one is uh, the, we have a lot of inconsistency of data. For, for example, here we have a lot of spatial analysis, uh, the data, a lot of inconsistency of data for spatial analysis for forest uh, restoration planning uh, from very various sources some different scale, some different uh, inconsistency with time of data and different information. And we have uh, a, lack, uh, a lack of uh, social, social and economic information for making the uh, forest resolution planning. And uh, yes, for priority, we set uh, uh, for forest uh, resolution priority in Vietnam, in forest sector, we uh, Focus right now. We focus on three sectors. The first one is enrichment planting and uh, assisted natural regeneration in uh, degraded uh, natural forests. We focus on the natural forest and uh, reforestation from unused land is the main focus of natural forest and uh, afforestation for forest plantings. And we also extend the rotation. Uh, like uh, we introduce a lot of uh, some uh, native species for with long term. Uh, rotation and for uh, forest restoration priority area, we focus on the main the three uh, type of forest. We focus on the protection forest. The second one is a special use forest. Is a focus on the national park or national reserve area, and <clears throat> the third one is a uh, we also focus on the protection forest for uh, forest basin. And um, right now in Vietnam, we have a lot of, uh, we have the eight ecoregion. And for app, uh, forest restoration blending, we are, uh, we are focused on the central highland where there is, uh, uh, there have been the up, up experience a lot of deforest, deforestation uh, from uh, 2000 up to now. And uh, um, um, the, uh, the Vietnamese government is uh, focused on the, the area for making the Planning for reforestation. Yes, it is some my some uh, it ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, yeah. Maria, and hi for uh, those presentations and Maria for nice actually summarizing the capacity development aspects, and also hi for sharing the challenge and challenges and priorities in the country context. Uh, hi, yeah, please uh, stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, we do look forward to uh, further engaging with colleagues and piloting the tools in the central highland areas. 
Uh, so I think um, this will serve as a good introduction to the Q&A session and hopefully will trigger further questions from the participants. So finally, uh, we now go into a Q&A session uh, with all of you. Um, now, I now would like to pass over to my colleague, uh, Yelena Feingold, for moderating a session, uh, who is an FAO forestry officer uh, working on innovative geospatial solutions, uh, who also has been working on the C plan development. Uh, we are running a bit late, but still, uh, I think we have um, sufficient time to discuss. So, Yelena, uh, over to you. I think we still have uh, more than 20 minutes to discuss. Thanks so much, Yoshihiko, and thank you, colleagues, for the very interesting presentations and overview of the CPLAN tool. It's been a great journey uh, with this group developing this tool, and we're really looking to, to the audience and for our users for feedback to uh, further develop and enhance this tool. Um, and it was also really great to hear from uh, from Hai, our colleague from Vietnam, to hear about some of the ambitions in Vietnam for restoration and how this tool can potentially be used to identify areas that are suitable for restoration. So we have quite a few uh, question and answers in the Q&A uh, already. Uh, so I'll just jump right in and start with a question to Jeff and Yuan Yuan. First, thank you for your excellent presentation that gave insight into the methodology used by CPLAN and the different layers that are available in the tool. And different users might be interested in running this analysis at different scales. So Jeff, as you mentioned, an international uh, conservation organization uh, might be interested on running this at a, a macro level or comparing multiple countries, while a small NGO might be focused on uh, a, a particular district for identifying areas for planting. So what are the limitations of running uh, the tool at a smaller scale? And we also have a question directly from uh, Davidson Lloyd asking how this tool can be applicable to small island states with limited or national location specific climate and land cover data. Thanks, Yelena. Uh, great questions. Uh, first on, on scale, it's our hope that this tool will be able to be used at multiple scales from uh, the macro to the micro, um, but uh, there are gonna be some limitations. And, and so on the macro side, uh, we have some country level measures in there, but of course conditions can vary within countries and the country level measures are not gonna reflect that. I mean, I, I'd give as an example, um, uh, we have a country risk premium that's been developed uh, to guide investors on locations where, um, uh, they likely face the fewest risks if they make an investment. Now, those variables or that that variable is developed at a national level, but the risk to investment could vary within a country. The tool is not going to pick that up. Um, but uh, of course, users may have much um, more detailed information about a particular country than we have as the developers. Um, after all, there's some 139 countries in this, this tool, and we're not experts on, on all of them. Um, so that additional information or knowledge of a particular country could be brought to bear. Um, so th there will be variation within countries that some of the variables will pick up, but, but others won't. So that gets to the macro question. The, the micro question, um, you know, some of the, uh, the layers are relatively coarse. Uh, we mentioned our opportunity cost layers at 10 square kilometers. Um, we just don't believe it's possible to develop reliable estimates with finer precision than that. Um, but again, local users will have a better understanding within particular locations of how um, uh, land values may vary. So um, at the macro level or the micro level, there would be some limits based on the, the, the resolution of the layers. Um, and in, in general, you know, as we get to, to you know, more and more local levels, you know, getting to uh, smaller and smaller grid cells, uh, the tool is going to become less and less accurate. And so, as I said, the, the, uh, the tool is really intended for larger scale planning, which will help to identify areas that uh, look, uh, uh, look more suitable for restoration. But then the detailed work within those is going to have to be done by restoration stakeholders to bring in additional knowledge uh, that they may have additional sources of, of information. I mean, an example would be our estimates of um, 
tree growth rates, which is part of the, uh, the benefit related to, to wood production. Um, uh, you know, the tree growth rate can vary tremendously just moving from one side of a ridge to another, which is a change which could be just a few meters, okay, as you walk across a ridge. The tool does not account for that kind of uh, detail. Um, so there, there will be some limitations um, indeed. Um, on on uh, the question about small island states, so we've drawn information from the best available data sources that we could. Um, if the, the states are really small, then the resolution of the data, you know, is, is going to be pretty coarse uh, for them. And so I think, you know, I, I would love to hear more from uh, those who are from small island states or um, work in small island states, you know, more from you on uh, where you see the issues with using uh, the tool if you um, uh, play around with it uh, some. Um, but we've attempted to construct the variables for all of the 139 low and middle income countries as, as best we could. Um, we've certainly not left out um, small island states. Um, uh, I just I also want to mention, um, Daniela uh, asked a, a question about um, uh, what's meant by uh, tree species in here. And I, I was typing an answer and I think it disappeared. I don't think it was, it was sent. Uh, somebody got messed up with my with that function or with my use of it. Um, Daniela, uh, just to respond here, and this does have some bearing on what we're just talking about. Um, the, um, from the standpoint of establishment costs, um, in a sense, we're looking at generic planting of trees, but on the other hand, there is uh, spatial variation in there, depending on the socioeconomic conditions and ecological conditions. So we, we have some reflection of that. The benefits, however, implicitly reflect different types of trees. So the benefit in terms of wood production is going to be based on plantation grown uh, tree growth rates, uh, whereas our biodiversity benefit is a function of biodiversity intactness and uh, threatened and, and endangered species. And so the, the tool does not um, specifically say which species should be grown, that's left to the users who are going to have more information on local conditions. But it will identify what the potential is for achieving certain benefits if species that are consistent with those benefits, you know, for example, if you want to restore biodiversity, then you would not necessarily want to uh, plant monocultures of uh, introduced species, okay? But if you were to use species that are consistent with that goal, then the tool will give you information on what the um, uh, potential biodiversity benefit could be. And uh, Danielle, I hope that help, helps answer your question. If not, then um, fire away and I'll, I'll follow up. Thanks, Jeff, for the very comprehensive uh, answer. And I see another very interesting question that probably can be answered by yourself and Yuan Yuan. Um, we have a question here from Sebastian. Um, and his question is, to what extent does the tool include the assessment of non-monetary cost benefits and costs, such as cultural values, place attachment, et cetera? Are, the pro are there prospects to develop uh, more non-monetary indicators. Okay, so, so the tool is not a valuation tool. It does not um, predict what the values of different uses of forests are. It identifies types of benefits and asks the user how important those different benefits are. Um, we currently do not have in there an indicator for cultural values. And, and a reason is just the difficulty of obtaining um, uh, information on those values. And, you know, for this tool, we need spatially explicit information. So we would need information on how cultural values may vary by location. We don't have that information. Um, if you're aware of a source that could point us to that, then we could build that into the tool. But uh, currently that's not a, a value that's built in there. I mean, there is a biodiversity layer and if an important aspect of biodiversity is its, its cultural significance, then by putting a high rating on biodiversity, you'd be signaling uh, that you value that uh, uh, cultural significance of biodiversity highly. So it could be included indirectly in that way, but there's no direct, um, uh, first of all, there, there's no valuation in the tool and there's currently no benefits indicator that is specifically linked to uh, cultural values. And Yuan Yuan, uh, you have would you like to compliment at all? 
Yeah, uh, so I agree with what uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff's answers. And I just the following Jeff's answers, and I'd like to emphasize the possibilities that users could upload their own data sets with finer resolutions or very better or very even more detailed information on costs, uh, constraints, benefits, and so on, for example. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bo. Um, then another, I see a few questions also asking about the functionality of the tool. So perhaps we can uh, ask those to Karis and John. Um, I see one question from, um, from Faisal asking uh, how can uh, the accuracy of the output be confirmed? Uh, so. Um, and perhaps we can also then after that answer a question from Sonia asking about um, how the actual results will be exported and will it be possible to see those in PDF, Excel, uh, perhaps some map output. So if you could just talk about the, the outputs of the tool, thanks. Maybe I'll um, respond to the accuracy and then um, I also invite Jeff and Yuan Yuan to add to that. And then John, you can talk about the how to save the results. Um, so the accuracy of the um, layers is a really good question. I'll just say, you know, the first kind of initial output is an indicator of how suitable lands are for restoration. Um, so it's harder to assess accuracy there. Um, and a lot of these estimates that go into it are um, projected benefits based on these global data sets. So I don't know that um, that we'd recommend assessing accuracy of these you know, specific indicators um, or even some of the input layers, but what we would recommend is if you have you know, national data sets or more specific data sets where you have used um, local data to calibrate them. Uh, you can kind of assess, you know, the, the precision of those estimates. Um, you could go out and do some accuracy assessments, but it would require quite a lot of field work. Um, so some of the input that is going into the model includes things like, um, you know, indicators of biodiversity, species richness that are there in the region. Um, carbon storage. So if you have national NFI data, you could maybe, you know, assess how good that layer is. Um, but overall, um, instead of assessing accuracy, I think the key thing here is, you know, engaging with your stakeholders who know the region and looking at the map results um, and seeing, do the, the mapped areas with high value make sense? Um, do they, you know, align with where you think there are you know, high conservation regions or carbon rich regions, um, and hopefully they do. Um, and then also, you know, based on your knowledge of the land cover. So think about where you have agriculture or if you have those national data, land cover data sets, you can integrate those and see what they look like. Um, and then a lot of the information is, you know, kind of projections of what benefits you would anticipate seeing if you restored these lands. So those are a little bit harder to do the measurements until after you restore the lands as well. And, you know, there's always some uncertainty with the future in terms of um, just risks that are going into and affecting um, the restoration to take into account. So, and maybe I'll open this up to Jeff and Yuan Yuan too to provide some um, alternative ideas or feedback mm -hmm. on it. That's great, Karis. I mean, all I'd say is that uh, developing some measures of, of accuracy is, is important. And, um, you know, that's something that we're working on doing, uh, but haven't done yet. And it's going to be more possible for some of the layers uh, than for others. Um, but we, we do intend to uh, come up with some uh, estimates, uh, which would provide at least, you know, rough confidence bounds on the measures developed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the second question was asking about the outputs of the tool. John, you can take that one. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so at the moment, you can export the results map either as a TIFF to your Sepal account, uh, which you can then download locally, um, or export it as a Earth Engine image asset. Um, currently, the dashboard is exported as a JSON file, uh, but we are working on finding a way to export the dash dashboard in a nicer format, such as a PDF, um, and also working on a way to convert the GeoJSON format to something that's a little nicer for people to work with, such as a CSV. Thanks all for the, for the great answers. Um, and I see that there has been, there's a lot of interest uh, to use this tool. We have a lot of enthusiasm with the participants here and people writing in the chat that, you know, that they'd like to actually get their hands on it and test it. Um, so maybe uh, John, if you can just walk someone through how, how they could actually um, get to that tool. Yeah, so the uh, the tool is located in the uh, Sapal platform. So if you go to sapal.io, I believe. Um, and then if you have an account, you can log in. But if you don't have an account, you, you need to sign up for one. Um, but once you've logged into Sapal, you can go to the application section. Um, it will be the little icon that looks like a wrench on the left-hand side. And then in the search bar of the application section, if you just type in C-Plan, uh, the tool will, will populate in the search and clicking on it will start running the tool. And that's how you get to it. Thanks. And, uh, and then the, I, maybe our last question, we just have a few minutes left. Uh, to uh, Yoshihiko and Maria, I think there are also many are in interested to provide feedback, uh, further feedback to the tool, maybe on layers that they'd like to see, or uh, further engagement with our group on uh, exploring the use of their tool for actual restoration planning. Um, so, so what are some of the future plans? Yeah, um, I can take uh, that question first, uh, maybe. And then, uh, yeah, um, Maria, please feel free to compliment. So yeah, thanks very much, Yelena, for the question. Um, uh, we do appreciate um, your feedback uh, from colleagues so that we can further improve the functionality and data layers. Um, so we have indeed uh, prepared a, a form, feedback form. I hope Pierrick or Maria can uh, share the link in the chat box or somewhere. Uh, so I do encourage our colleagues to share your comments, feedback, or even questions here. Uh, so we'll be able to respond to you uh, through the contact information you, you will provide there. And uh, for the training opportunities, I think uh, Maria has already answered to several questions in the QA box. But um, yeah, as she mentioned, um, there are indeed some plans for piloting the tool with support from uh, CyberCab on NASA Sylvia hats. So if you're working in the country or across to the country uh, where you will be organiz organizing the workshop, uh, you might be able to uh, join us, but um, just do contact us uh, so that we can further discuss the opportunity. Did I answer all the questions? <laughs> I think so, I think so. And if we haven't um, answered any of the questions or um, if you'd like to rewatch us, we will be sharing the recording and also some follow-up notes with the Q&A with all of the questions um, from participants and answers from our panelists. Um, so thank you so much for this really interactive and dynamic Q&A session. And I'd like to pass the floor back to Yoshihiko to close it off. Great, thank you so much, Elena. And um, I see Maria just joined, turned on the video. If you wanted to compliment something, uh, please do so. But if not, I can proceed to the closing. Yeah, please or... proceed to the closing. I think, uh, yeah, we, we can discuss with everybody specifically, depending on their context and their work, we, we are open to collaborate and do trainings as needed. Great.
Yeah, uh, thanks so much everyone, um, all the panelists for the rich discussion and the questions from the participants indeed. So these are really informative and helpful for us to further improve the tool. So as Julian mentioned at the very beginning, the tool will keep evolving with your feedback. And as I mentioned, um, we have prepared a form to collect further feedback from you. So please do take a moment and provide your thoughts there. So um, yeah, as also mentioned, uh, webinar recording and presentation materials will be shared in due course, along which we'll be sharing short answers, perhaps, to the questions uh, put by audience, but um, perhaps we couldn't answer free, in which case, yeah, we'll be uh, sharing the short answer to that. And finally, uh, I wanted to turn the floor one last time to Julian for a few words to conclude the webinar, but I think he had to run to another meeting. So I would like to wrap this up on his behalf. So uh, really big thanks to you, um, to all the speakers, and also, of course, to everyone uh, joining us and sticking us around. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and got some insight on how C plan tool could help plan uh, your restoration work in different contexts and landscapes. And do hope to see uh, many of you in our future workshops. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, take care, everyone. Bye.